Good day, everyone. Welcome to the last installment of the ISA short webinar series. I am Joseph Anthony Hermosilla. I will be presenting the webinar entitled uh, Cybersecurity Awareness for UPLB Admin Lawyers. Let's get started. Before I proceed to the main content of this webinar, I would like to introduce our group, which is the Systems Research Group. The content of this webinar is based from the contributions of the members from our group, which is composed of the following. Uh, Sir Christopher, Ray Christopher Lactuan, Mamia Quiliste, Mam Betel de Robles, Sir Clinton Poserio, and Sir Chris Templado. Our group is interested in topics in or related to operating systems, computer networks, security, and uh, robotics. To know more about our group, you can visit the link at the bottom, which contains our website, group's website. Let's proceed. So we begin by knowing or understanding the definition of uh, computer security. First, we give a, a textbook definition. It says that uh, computer security is the protection afforded to an automated information system in order to attain the applicable objectives of preserving the integrity, availability, and confidentiality of information system resources. I've underlined the main components of the definition. Uh, I failed to highlight protection. So the emphasis is actually on protection of what? Of an information system. So this means that we live in a digital age. We have the concept of information system. And uh, the information system is actually composed of uh, different uh, resources which include hardware, software, firmware, actual data in the information system, and telecommunication. So that's the essence of uh, computer security, uh, the definition of computer security. Now we can also look at the legal definition of cybersecurity, which actually, I actually took this from the RA number 10175 document, which states that cybersecurity refers to the collection of tools, policies, risk management approaches, actions, training, best practices, assurance, and technologies that can be used to protect the cyber environment and organization and users' assets. So I've also underlined the important terms in this definition. So the one thing that you might want to know is cyber. What, what do we mean by cyber? And from the same document, cyber refers to a computer or a computer network, the electronic medium in which online communication takes place. So essentially, you can uh, say we can say that cyber is equivalent to the resources that is being described here in the, our textbook definition. And of course, assets will refer to the sources. So given this definition, we can now move on to a very important concept in computer security or uh, concepts which is normally referred to as the CIA triad. And uh, the CIA triad are the following. Confidentiality. Proper. Okay, so we have confidentiality. We have integrity. We have availability. These are the CIA triad. Confidentiality may refer to two items. We have data confidentiality, which means that the information should not be disclosed to unauthorized individuals. And the other one is data privacy, 
in which the, is the individual who controls what information related to them is collected, stored by whom, and to whom that information may be closed. So, the basic idea about confidentiality is familiar to us already. So, we have some documents. We don't like others to see that document in our work, in our ad admin work. So, probably we don't want to... Uh, we don't want our records to be uh, to be readable by others, not authorized to read our records. The second the concept is integrity, which can be grouped, uh, which can be categorized into two. We have data integrity and system integrity. Data integrity means that the information and programs are changed only in a specific and authorized manner. If you are not allowed to change, let's say, your salary in a spreadsheet or in a database, uh, or a program should not be modified to perform other functions, then that is uh, data integrity. And system integrity means that the system performs its intended function in an unimpaired manner. And the last uh, item or concept in the CIA triad is availability, which means that the system should work promptly and the server is not uh, the service is not denied to authorized users. So those are the uh, three main concepts, and computer security actually is involves uh, protecting against the loss of confidentiality, the loss of integrity or the loss of availability. In addition to these three, we also have authenticity and accountability. Authenticity would mean that if you're receiving data from someone, uh, you should be able to know, uh, to show that that data is authentic and it really came from the actual sender of that particular data. That's just an example. Okay, so let's move on to the next item which are the terminologies okay. so when it comes to computer security there are a lot of terminologies and sometimes i am also confused with a lot of these terminologies but we have a few items here that allow us to somehow at least appreciate uh, the, uh, the field so we have uh, ad adversary or the attacker or the hacker is the entity that acts Note that is an entity, so it can be an individual or a group of individuals or an organization. Attack or a hack is a deliberate attempt to evade the security services and violate the security policies. Usually, we are given a, we have a security policy. Then, uh, when those uh, policies are violated, it's actually called an attack. Then we have a countermeasure or control. These are actions, device techniques, or procedures that reduces a threat, vulnerability, or attack. An example, encryption. So it's a countermeasure for a uh, countermeasure in the loss of uh, confidentiality. Uh, hashing, okay. uh, ASLR, address space layout randomization. To counter measure uh, as a counter measure for uh, memory corruption attacks, uh, strong passwords, etc. So in the study in this webinar, we're going to look at some attacks, possible attacks, and then what are the counter measures and controls uh, to uh, prevent these attacks. The next one is risk. Uh, this, uh, this term is actually difficult to articulate, but risk, it says here, is an expectation of loss expressed as the probability that the threat will exploit a vulnerability resulting to harm. So, uh, normally, uh, in organizations, uh, there is a topic called uh, uh, risk assessment. So, given uh, in computer security, given these threats, these vulnerabilities, the organization will assess the, this, uh, somehow quantify 
the combination of these threats and vulnerabilities, whether they were, they're going to take action or not to be able to mitigate these threats and vulnerabilities. So that's actually risk. Most people uh, would think, ah, the risk is not uh, that bad, so we can just ignore that particular threat. So, then the next one is security policy, which is a set of rules and practices that specify how a system provides security services. So we, I, ha I have an example document uh, of security policy later. Then next one is asset or system resource. So this refers to the ones described in the definition in the resources in the information system, which can, ref which can refer to hardware, uh, software, data, network, telecommunication. Uh, example of assets or system resource is student records, uh, PIIs, health records. Threat. So the next one is threat uh, is a possible danger that might exploit a vulnerability. Example of a threat will be an authorized access of student records. For example, we have the assets here, student records, and then there is a threat, okay? This wish that, uh, that these records might be accessed by uh, some people, sometimes called, uh, also known as uh, data breach, or there is a threat for a ransomware attack, a threat for identity theft, or account takeover, etc., etc. So, these are examples of threats for uh, a malware infection, etc. And the next definition is uh, vulnerability. It's a flow. Uh, it's a flow in a system's design, implementation, operation, management that can be exploited. Now, information system, as find, we have hardware, we have software, we have network. Those are actually products, and being products. They are created, somehow called manufactured or developed, and, in during, and during the design and implementation, there might be some flaws in them. So uh, those flaws are called vulnerabilities, okay, which uh, can actually be exploited, meaning uh, uh, a tool can be developed to uh, exploit or attack that particular vulnerability. And then when a threat is realized, then we have what we call security. For example, uh, next year, somebody will publish online the list of all students in UPLB, including their grade, grades and their records in a repository somewhere. That is called a security incident, and that is a data breach. So, realized threat. So, when it comes to computer security, we have to at least understand uh, these terms so that we can uh, somehow uh, communicate with the correct uh, with with the security people. Okay. Now let's move on to cybersecurity awareness training. So what's the purpose of cybersecurity awareness training? Now, uh, cybersecurity awareness does not necessarily mean that you have to be very technical about things, right? But awareness is somehow enough already to be able to ensure that employees in an organization are aware of possible cybersecurity threats at least minimize the incidents and reduce damage or harm. For example, uh, if you know uh, that there is a threat in, let's say, uh, identity theft, this means that at least the employees will be informed that, hey, you don't uh, uh, provide too much personal information uh, on your social media account because others might uh, steal your identity. So that is the idea of having 
cybersecurity awareness training. This is not a technical training, but rather somehow uh, not so technical. Then the next one is it enables employees to take appropriate actions when security incident occurs. Okay? So at least if uh, the employee knows that there is an attack that is ongoing, then he or she will know how to respond to that ongoing attack. Or an incident happened, then the employee will be able to take the appropriate actions to report the incident. The next one is avoid criminal charges. Okay? Uh, in the succeeding slides, we're going to talk about some of the laws. Okay, and uh, sometimes uh, in the in the laws we have what you call cyber crimes. So at least if the employee is knowledgeable about the possible cyber crimes, then he or she can avoid committing those cyber crimes. Therefore, avoid criminal charges. Uh, compliance to regulations. So uh, the government will sometimes require to do this to do that. Okay, so. At least the employee will be knowledgeable to uh, on the topics or on the things that must be done in order to comply to the requirements uh, imposed by the government. And of course, a step to future-proof UPLB. So if the employees here will be knowledgeable or aware about cybersecurity threats, then it's a step to future-proof UPLB. Okay, so we all have we have uh, policies and laws. Okay? So this section is all about uh, some of the, the importance of policy. So as mentioned, as defined in the previous uh, in this uh, item, security policy is the set of rules and practices that specify how a system provides security services. So UP system or the UP, UP as an organization has its own. Uh, acceptable use policy which is published in the uh, website of the ITC so there is a document there that uh, is entitled approved acceptable use policy for IT resources of the UP system which describes the acceptable uh, things that you can do or not do with the uh, IT resources provided by the UP system, computing facilities, emails. So as constituent or as an employee of UP, we should abide by these uh, policies so that we will not be violating these policies and we will not be penalized for violating these policies. Of course, at the... Uh, up level, we have uh, certain laws that uh, we have to follow, okay? and this include the following. We have the RA10175, which is the Cybercrime Prevention Act. Uh, we also have the Data Privacy Act of 2012. We have Anti-Child Pornography Act. Uh, uh, that okay, we have read about this uh, duplicate. Uh, we have RA nine 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 five with anti photo and video voyeurism act. Uh, we have the e commerce act and the national security uh, policy. Okay, so we have all of these laws that somehow we have to follow and thus. This security aware awareness webinar will some of, at least uh, help us comply uh, with uh, this laws. I have uh, these links here, so when I share the PDF of this presentation, you can just click on this and read about the details of these different uh, RAs. Okay, so last last week I was able to attend a conference from Trend Micro. 
Red Micro is a security company with uh, which hosts a conference called Decode. And uh, this is actually a virtual conference, and I happen to attend most of the talks in this uh, conference. And there was a presentation from the PNP, Anti Cybercrime Group. And uh, they have uh, these slides. So I'm going to use this, uh, these slides here. So, according to the uh, presenter, to the head of the PNP AC, the trend is that there is an increasing trend in the cybercrime uh, violation or uh, presence of cybercrime in the Philippines. And uh, there are statistics, these figures show that uh, until Janu uh, September, we already have uh, 4,239 uh, cybercrimes documented. Uh, this slide also shows the 10 most uh, prevailing cybercrime in the Philippines right? yeah, for this uh, year. Right? So we have 1, 2, 3, 10. And the number one is online scam. Right? So this means usually these are things like uh, online selling but the item is fake or something like that. Then we have the next one is online libel. Uh, identity theft. System interference or hacking. System interference is a violation or a loss of, or a violation of availability. Okay. Uh, Anti-photo and video voyeurism. Okay. Online threat. Uh, unjust uh, vexation, ATM, credit fraud, card fraud, illegal access, robbery, extortion, extortion. And this pie chart shows that majority actually are online scam and the, the next one is uh, online libel. As you can see in this trend, okay, uh, it's very important that we have really have some understanding or awareness of this cybersecurity threat so that we can respond or prepare accordingly. And this is a figure of the total number of operations conducted and the number of persons, uh, actually the number of persons arrested uh, with uh, and charged probably with uh, cyber, cyber crimes. 168. This is just those who are, are caught, who were caught, but there are a lot of uh, criminals that are not just caught. Okay. So we now move on to data privacy, which uh, I said in the previous slide shows is actually under confidentiality. Data privacy would uh, mean that it is the individual who controls the, what can, what information to share or what can be done on the information that he or she is sharing to a third party. So again, uh, I took this information from the Decode conference. There was a, speak, a speaker from the National Privacy Commission who talked about five things you need to know about uh, personal data breaches. And he presented a few guiding principles when it comes to uh, data privacy. First one is called is, is transparency. In transparency, it's very important that, for example, UP or offices in, in UPLB will be obtaining information from students, from third parties, and this is actually done using Google Forms, right? And when we do that, we should provide uh, privacy notices and uh, policies whenever we obtain this information to inform the, the one answering the form or let's say the evaluation form that the data that he or she will provide will be used for a specific purpose only. 
and this is what we're going to do this is how we're, how long we're going to retain your data nothing else at least that's the idea transparency inform the users uh, the provider of information that this is what we're going to do with your data second one is legitimate uh, purpose so you should uh, obtain consent so you cannot just probably scrape data from the uh, uh, social media platform or uh, let's say copy the data posted uh, on some uh, bulletin board by right? personal information so you should uh, obtain consent and ask the provider of the information okay i uh, uh i accept or uh i allow you to use my information for this purpose and if there is also a, le a legal basis basis then that will be nice then the next the third principle is called proportionality proportionality would mean that you only process as process the data that you need for a particular purpose a common example of this is the uh or the COVID uh, uh, tracing apps, a very uh, controversial uh, topic. I, personally, I don't use these uh, COVID uh, tracing apps. Why? Because uh, I don't trust the developers and I don't, yes, I don't trust basically the developers for the organizations that uh, deploy them, especially private companies. Because I, don't, I do not know the extent of the use of the data and what information they are asking from me. For example, if they can, uh, the moment they ask for my birth date, right, that's a no-no already, and other information. So, we as employees in UPLB, when we collect information, should be able to uh, make sure that we only obtain information that we really need. Then, of course, also have to consider the data subjects' rights. If uh, the data subject requests that I, will, I please remove my information, then that is the right of that particular individual. Okay, so reporting a data breach, okay, so based also on the same presentation. So they provide in the talk, they, he provided an email address where to report the data breach. And uh, in communication, communicating a data breach, you have to specify or describe the nature of the breach, uh, the personal data possibly involved, the measures taken to address. So we have this uh, link here that tells us how to report. Uh, usually this is done by the uh, DPO or the data protection. So in UPLB, I found this uh, entry in the UPLB website. So it uh, posted on December 25, uh, November, September 25, 2019, wherein there was a presentation or orientation on the UPLB uh, of UPLB employees on Data Privacy Act. And of course, we have uh, uh, the, our data protection officer stated in, this, uh, in that particular post in UPLB. Okay, so let's move on to the work from home setup. Okay? So as UPLB employees, um, we have to uh, transition to a work from home setup. And what are the implications of a work from home setup? So the first one is that IT support are not readily available, unlike before, where we can just dial a number and IT will respond. But nowadays, we don't have that luxury. So we are somehow we are on our own. Uh, second, security controls present within the campus network are absent at home. 
So usually we have some high-end security appliance deployed in ITC or deployed by ITC, some advanced firewalls, have some network intrusion detection systems that somehow at least uh, prevents attacks from the outside to our network. And we don't have that at home because we are left to our own after to secure our own network. And uh, the third one is uh, sharing of personal and work IT resources. I don't know, for some of you probably you're uh, at home, you're using your own laptops, your own desktops because you did, you were not able to bring your uh, office computers at ho uh, to your homes. So there is a tendency to share personal and work uh, IT resources. For example, your child is uh, doing an online class, so he's using your PC or whatever, so sharing. And that has some implications on security. Then the next one is intermix of work and personal activities. So sometimes while you are working, you will be interrupted and then suddenly your uh, screen will just be a different uh, uh, screen now because somebody used your computer while you are uh, cooking like that. So that will also have some implications on in terms of so it's a totally different environment and sometimes we have to be more vigilant uh, when it comes to security so the first thing usually uh, in my case is to have a an inventory of the work from home equipment or devices that or gadgets that i use for work and this is a typical list. I don't know if you have uh, ad, uh, other items here, but first you need to have a laptop or a desktop. So I have a laptop and a laptop here. Then uh, you have the wireless router. This is actually the one you use to be able to connect your laptop and your tablets or cell phone to the internet. You have the tablet, cell phone, and for storage, transferring data, probably you have USB flash drives. Then uh, for backup, you usually have uh, USB external hard drive. Me, I don't have a printer at home, but you might have a printer in your home. So that's also part of your, uh, or the inventory of your uh, work from home equipment. So, from this, we can now move uh, from with this inventory. We can now move up uh, to the layers uh, when uh, securing the or securing our work from home environment. So, in our uh, in this uh, webinar, we're going to consider a scenario wherein uh, your laptop broke down. Okay. and your laptop crashed and what do you do so you're doing something and then your laptop suddenly crashed there's a black screen and what do you do so start with the backup procedure so here we're going to use the windows 10 operating system i don't know if you are still using old operating system but uh uh, in my observation, there are still Windows XP and Windows 7 operating systems that are being used in the university. But uh, in this webinar, we're going to focus on Windows 10. For the backup procedure, first we have to disconnect all devices and period. So we assume that there was a crash, an unrecoverable crash, and we are left to nothing but to reformat the machine. So we disconnect all devices and peripherals connected to the laptop, switch on the system, Switch it off to the three times until the Windows system boot advanced options appear. And at this point, some of you will be able to log into your machine and uh, can perform a backup. So you choose the command prompt option. Then once you have the command prompt, you open up some of the tools that you will need to be able to back up the whatever data was lost during the crash 
then you format the machine and then install uh, a new operating system, fresh install of the operating system. So normally, this will happen if uh, you have a ransomware attack. Uh, Sir LK uh, discussed uh, with me last time that his friend actually was uh, uh, encountered a ransomware attack. So he has no choice but to reformat the machine instead of paying the, uh, the one who attacked his laptop. Right? So after this, you get a fresh start. So given this, uh, you have already set up or installed your operating system, we'll now move on to securing the, or uh, enabling the basic security controls for your uh, newly installed operating system. Again, we focus on the Windows 10 basic security controls. And uh, you can do this by visiting the settings, by uh, searching settings, and then our uh, main focus are the privacy and uh, update security options. So if we select update and security, we are going to uh, be presented with these options. So we first look at, we're going to look at the Windows update and Windows security. Now this is a, a common observation. Most people do not update their computers. Okay? Uh, Maybe one reason is that the update takes uh, a lot of time, but it's very important that you should always update your system so that the vulnerabilities that are discovered will be patched by the uh, most recent updates. Okay? So please take note of that, that you should always update your system. So we look at uh, Windows Update and then Windows Security. For example, uh, here I have uh, uh, an indicator that uh, there is an update available. So I have to uh, apply this update. So make sure that you always do that. Then the next is the, so this one is under window security. Under window security, there are two things that, at least two things that you need to consider. We have the uh, option on the virus threat protection and the firewall uh, option. Now, the virus, virus threat option will protect your system from malware. Assuming that uh, you have an updated system and then a new malware uh, tries to get into your system, malware is malicious software like a virus or a trojan or a worm, then uh, it can easily be detected. So make sure that all of the switches here are switched on so that you'll get uh, alerts whenever a malicious event is happening on your machine. And of course, the firewall. Okay? So most devices nowadays are connected to a network. And your machine actually has doors called ports in which uh, the firewall tries to protect those ports. So a firewall is more of like a security guard that guards the, the ports and make sure that they are on so that whenever an attempt is made, then uh, that attempt will be, uh, 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 be noticed and you will be alerted. Okay, so we now move on to user accounts. When it comes to user accounts, uh, remember that in a work from home setup, I said a while ago that uh, there will be sharing of the personal and work related IT resources. So one way to uh, do that is to create separate user accounts, one for your child, one for your husband, one for your wife, etc etc for all other users in your home if you have only a single pc you can create user accounts so to do that you go to the add user accounts and then family and other users uh, and you can click add someone else to this pc then uh, usually you will be asked to specify a sign or an email but you can choose this option 
I don't have this person signing information. Then from there you can uh, will be uh, redirected to this uh, box, dialog box. So you can select this option, add a user without a Microsoft account. Then you specify the credentials for the user, like username and password. And you will also be prompted for, uh, we call the security questions. So I'd like to emphasize this uh, security questions. Okay? So these security questions are used to ensure that whenever you lost your password, you will still be able to uh, get into the system. And some attackers would, will actually try to obtain this information via social media. Let's say if you are a member of a certain group, you will see some posts there that ask questions like, what was your first pet's name? Then you seem to type dog. And then uh, that can actually be used in the future by possible attackers. So make sure, uh, this is one uh, technique, to make sure that you don't answer these types of questions uh, on, the, on social media. Okay? These are very important. And from after creating the account, you will now be presented with the user account. And now have uh, two users uh, on this machine. So a good practice also is to make sure that when you are not on your PC, especially if you're show sharing your PC, is to log out. Of the machine or lock this at least lock 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 the screen whenever you're going to uh move away from your uh machine let's say when you're going to the cr or where you're going to anywhere make sure to lock your uh computer so that uh you will not be many masalisihan okay? ng isang attack isang malicious individual okay so Another uh, interesting uh, aspect of the work in the work from home setup is the movement of data. Right? So you have your data in if you are working in the in you in the campus, you have your data on your computer, and you should not move that data out of the office. And nowadays you can do that by uploading it to a cloud uh, storage like Google Drive, or you can copy that to uh, external storage like the USB flash drives or the USB external hard disk. But the problem is we have also a concept of physical security. What if the flash, uh, flash drives or flash disk or the hard disk drives are stolen and all the data that are important are on those, uh, uh, on those flash drives or those disks? So, we need to uh, apply encryption okay, to somehow uh, enforce confidentiality. And uh, in Windows 10, uh, you have this bit locker, but I think most people have a home edition of Windows 10, so bit locker is not uh, present. So I recommend the use of Veracrypt. Okay. So it's a, an encryption uh, tool that will allow you to encrypt data. So you place your data on your uh, flash drive encrypted, you move it out, it gets stolen. As long as they don't have the password or the key to open that uh, the volume, then attackers will not be able to get your data. This is a good uh, tool. And here's an illustration. So it can actually be used uh, in a flash drive, but you can also use it on uh, uh, on, uh, on your hard disk. So, for example, if you want to use this on a flash drive, this is your flash drive, you're going to uh, place on that hard drive the portable uh, Veracrypt executable, and you're going to have a volume here that will be opened by uh, Veracrypt. This is the volume. So this is an example demonstration here. So I opened Veracrypt. Uh, initially, I already created a volume. 
Okay, so th this is an example of volume. So the volume will store, store the encrypted data. And then I use Veracrypt to mount that particular volume. And once it's mounted, I can actually access it like the like an ordinary file system, an ordinary entry in, in uh, Explorer, and I can place data on that particular uh, drive. So this means that all this data will be encrypted. Okay? If a user get hold of the volume, they will not be able to open the, the contents unless they know the key or the password. A very good tool. And if you have some sensitive data, you can store them in using or encrypt them using Veracrypt. Okay, so the next item on our list uh, is wireless router. The wireless router we focus on, so the router is used to connect to the internet. And usually, it has an admin page. So... Here are the things that uh, you can do to secure the uh, router. So you go to the admin page. So you have to secure the uh, admin page. And so this is an example admin page. And you need to change the default credentials. Sometimes there's an option called uh, MAC filtering. MAC is media access control. Okay? Is actually each computer or each device has a a MAC address assigned to each uh, to its uh, network interface card, and you can actually specify what uh, MAC addresses can connect through this uh, particular access point or router. Then you need to use strong Wi-Fi protection, uh, the WPA2. Also disable broadcast SSID and upgrade uh, the firmware. My observation is that uh, in uh, normally we buy cheap uh, products, cheap routers, and these cheap routers usually are difficult to upgrade. And over time, there will be some vulnerabilities that will be discovered on, on that particular uh, model of you are a router and you have no choice but to if you if you value security you can you have to replace that particular wireless router but for other devices you can actually uh, upgrade the firmware say firmware this is the operating system that uh, runs on the wireless router next one is uh, don't assign a public ip address unless you know what you are doing because if you place your wireless access router on the internet or, or yes it has a public ip address then that will be attacked almost immediately example here i have uh, what's my ip so right now i'm in campus so this is what i will get In the case that uh, I am uh, inside the campus network, the devices here are not exposed to the internet. Phones and tablets. So I also inter interviewed some of the admin staff in ICS, and uh, they use phones and tablets for work. And what are the things that you need to consider when it comes to? Uh, phones and tablets so you need to consider the apps that you install so you have to make sure that your you install updates to the apps called on your phone and also you can check the different uh, app permissions what apps are accessing my contacts what apps are accessing my sms and other uh, parts of the phone or your mobile device you can look if this is for android only you can check for the privacy and security settings you can search that in your uh, android phone 
can check uh, some of the settings there. And of course, you need to check the specifications of your machine and uh, you can actually look at the different settings to adjust this. Make sure that you are proactive when it comes to securing uh, these devices, right? Not just uh, use it in. Okay, the next item on our webinar is emails, passwords, and sessions. So the email is a gateway to the internet services. Usually, the first thing you have to do uh, when you're growing up, a child, your mother will create an email address for you. And, uh, or when you're in high school or college, you eventually create your own email address. But it's basically a gateway to internet services. And the idea is to use more, uh, a more secure email service provider, like uh, the UP Mail, which is managed by Google. Uh, UP Mail has lots of benefits. You can use it for academic and work-related purposes. So normally, I, I use it for uh, certain, uh, to avail free services. For example, in some events, in some products, they will require you to provide a, an email address that is uh, managed by the university. At up.edu.ph is very important for us. So we recommend to use Gmail. It's, it's easy to create and use multiple Gmail accounts for different uh, purposes. And it's also easy to migrate from other email providers to Gmail. So other things to note about email, uh, do not open suspicious email attachments, especially if the people uh, coming from people you do not know, because this uh, may contain programs that can be executed by your computer, like uh, files with .exe, .ebs, and .bat. Uh, example, this one, I love you text that .vbs way back in time, you have the I love you virus. And you also have uh, something like this, some PDF file, which is actually a batch file. I will show a demonstration of this later. And uh, this one also. I also would like to rec uh, be careful when using reply all and BCC. Okay? So a lot of people have leaked information by uh, doing some reply all and then failing to check who will be the recipients and posting, uh, not you, uh, emailing, not using the BCC, actually leaks all the email addresses. Okay, so you have to be careful with that also. And uh, we have this uh, illustration here from Among Us, I think, and uh, illustration of that. Some imposter will try to that. Okay, so you should also uh, should not open links from unknown sources. Okay? So do not open emails from unknown domains as much as possible. As you get curious, so you just click that and open. Then uh, that's why we use at up.edu.ph. So if at this point in time you are an ad admin employee and you're still using your at Yahoo or at Gmail email addresses for while working, please make sure that you uh, migrate or you use at up.edu.ph. So somehow at least uh, that person will know, a recipient will know that this one is coming from uh, an employee of uh, UP. Please make sure that you have and is using the at up.edu.ph. I observed that some uh, admin employees still use their Gmail accounts uh, for work-related stuff. So as much as possible, separate work-related related emails from uh, personal emails. Uh, so double-check the email address. So this is one way to confuse the receiver of an email. Uh, Gmail, for example, will have will display the display name first before the email address. And an attacker will might uh, do something like this. 
I change the display name. I have an example later. Then, but actually, the email address is like this. So that's actually uh, quite dangerous. And always, uh, luckily, the IP, ITDC is uh, always sending out ITC and ITDC. UPLB ITC is always sending out advisories regarding uh, attacks and uh, they always send reminders. So let us try to follow the reminders uh, and advisories uh, being sent by ITDC and UPLB ITC. Okay, so if you want, at this point in time, you realize that you haven't actually visited the the settings of your email account you can go at, uh, to this link https colon slash slash my account at google.com security assuming that you are logged in to your gmail account you can view the security settings here at least you have uh, have to specify the recovery phone and the recovery email is you lost control of your account and you should also enable two-step verification uh, the, why do we need two-step verification uh, well the idea here is some people can actually automate the login process and without a two-step verification it's possible that others may be able to take over or control your account and also you have to check apps connected to your account so all this information can be checked when you visit this Think when you are logged in. And in case you forgot your password, right, assuming that you have properly set the recovery phone and recovery email, then you can visit this URL to recover your uh, Google account. Or if you lost your password you can actually ask itdc uh, help desk to recover your uh, password or to recover your account this is very important i've seen a lot of uh, people who said that i forgot my up account admin stuff uh, so i'm using my gmail account okay ordinary gmail account please please uh recover your at up account and use that for work related uh, activities password tips okay uh, so passwords is a, are very important in our online transactions and some tips here first it must be easy to remember but not that easy for others to learn or guess so do not use passwords like middle name, uh, first name, birth year, or birthday, zodiac sign, etc. So a lot of people can easily guess that. Apps require a minimum length for passwords, usually characters. And as much as possible, make sure that your password is not found in the dictionary. Because we have what you call dictionary-based accounts, uh, attacks. For example, uh, brute force attacks that uses a particular dictionary to guess uh, your password so it's a combination of letters numbers and symbols and one technique is to replace vowels with numbers for example you have parallelization you, re you replace a with the four uh, i with one o with the zero so that's one technique but again some attacks can still possible to uh, to retrieve this particular password, to crack this password. And you can check the password requirements for a particular app and then adjust your passwords accordingly. As much as possible, do not reuse passwords by right? different accounts, different passwords, so that when an account is compromised, that password will not be used by uh, a technique called credential staffing. Right? So the idea quite difficult to track or to remember a lot of passwords. We're going to talk about OAuth later, and uh, one technique is to insert platform name in your password. So 
as a while ago it was uh, we used parallelization as the uh, password then we can specify google facebook or academia so these kinds of things so you build your own way to uh, to generate your password that will be easier for you to remember so the idea is different but same okay so like that so you have to be creative so that you will be it will be easier for you to remember your password at the same time difficult for others to guess but these are mere suggestions only well of course uh, it's it allows us to easily easily remember these passwords but there are no standards but usually it's a totally random password is the better password but how do you remember those uh, random passwords so uh, the where do you store your passwords the best storage is inside your mind if if, if you will write it on paper keep it hidden they usually uh, don't write it right or the last option is password managers i personally use this approach because i la i have a lot of accounts and i use that password manager to store my accounts my account information Okay. So they can generate passwords and store these on their secure servers. Uh, I usually do not use the cloud uh, server. I use a local uh, database. I have an example later. The advantage is that you only need to remember one uh, master password, which is the password for your password manager. But the problem is if your password is compromised, then your entire uh, database of passwords is already compromise a solution should always uh, enable multi-factor authentication as uh, discussed previously so here uh, is an illustration of the tool that i use is key pass to i store all store all my passwords here generate the passwords here whenever i log into an account uh, i use this uh, password however it's quite inconvenient it requires additional steps to do the copying and pasting but uh it's better than being but than your account being uh hacked or taken over so actually uh, you have going to have a lot of entries here p numbers passwords etc you right click and you add an entry Tips on updating your passwords, how frequent? It's up to you. Yearly, okay? monthly, etc. Some applications would force you to require the to change your password. Okay? So you have to change your passwords immediately when there is an attempt to log in to your account. You can also check this site, which is actually recommended also by the ITDC. Have I been phoned to check whether your email is part of a data breach? Uh, I I checked yesterday my account and uh, the problem is there was one hit which in which my email address is included in the latest uh, leak of uh, a breached uh, password uh, breach uh, accounts email addresses. So if you think someone else is using your account, someone is attempting to log in, make sure you change your password. Uh, this is a common problem in the ICS labs where, in stu where in students share computers. So most some students for, uh, for, forget to log in or log out of their accounts. And when the next student comes in, the account is still open and then uh, the current student will try to uh, uh, change the settings in the particular uh, machine, the login account. So make sure that you really have uh, uh, two factor authentication or multi factor authentication. Session. So, session is an active online connection to your account. It's logging into your account. Uh, so, when you log, log in, you have actually have a session. And it's good that you uh, keep track of your sessions uh, part of the session information that you can obtain the ip address from where that session is coming from uh, an estimate of the location where that 
account is currently logging in and the time and date when the session was open or last active normally if you're using a certain device regularly that will be recognized as a normal session but if at some point there's a new uh there's a new session coming from a different location wherein you are not usually connecting from then you will actually be alerted by system or by gmail uh, most apps let you delete sessions uh, let's say uh, from the computer lab you forgot to log out from that machine and then you log in at home so you can uh, terminate the session from your home you can terminate the session in the lab that you forgot to log out and also delete all sessions Gmail, you at the bottom right corner of your Gmail, just below the list of emails, you will find this. Okay, so the activities, get the information on the different sessions and the different activities. So from time to time, check this out so that you will know whether somebody is using your account uh, already. Okay. So Facebook, okay, this is an interesting uh, uh, effect of work from home setup. Facebook has now become part of the, uh, the way to communicate between students and uh, uh, the university. We post announcements, we post documents uh, on Facebook pages. And I think that's problematic because others might be able to gain access to sensitive information that we post on the these facebook pages but nonetheless it allows us to move forward so at this point we have i think we have no choice so but we do need to take some precautions when using facebook as our way to communicate to our students or to our uh, workmates so facebook Make sure that you check this out. So you visit when you're logged in in your PC, you visit this page and study all the settings there so that you can protect yourself. Okay, so, uh, but going back to sessions, you can actually see on the Facebook sessions uh, from where you connected. And you can, if you see someone connecting to your account or using your account currently, or act, uh, there's an active session, you can actually uh, terminate those sessions. Of course, you have to configure your uh, two-factor authentication, uh, alerts also, so it's very important. So as much as possible, uh, have an inventory of your online accounts, right? And uh, example, have an inventory what email addresses are you actually using up mail uh, are you using a personal email a gmail or a yahoo mail or are you using uh, the uplb.edu.ph uplb email right which is actually the one you use to connect to the uplb uh, wi-fi so I don't know about the security of that uh, service, but uh, you also need to add that to your inventory of online accounts. Social media, are you using FB, Twitter, IG, WhatsApp, or whatever? But, uh, banking and finance apps, so iAccess, Gcash, Paymaya, all these apps. Make sure that you have updated uh, copies of updated and digit copies of these apps a lot of uh, apps uh, are trojanized meaning uh, they look like the original app but there are some uh, apps that actually there are uh, malicious activities being performed by this app. so you have to be uh, careful or for example someone might send you an email that says there's a new update for the Gcash app. Download this and check this out. And fortunately, that is, that is not a legit uh, Gcash app and uh, your uh, cell phone is now compromised. 
work-related accounts. For example, uh, you have a UIS account, a payroll.uplb account, you have the SAIS account. So make sure that you uh, take uh, note of this account. Uh, an interesting thing is that if you use a password manager like KeePass2, you can actually uh, create this categorization and keep track of your account. So, for example, in my case, whenever I create a new account to a, part, to a, to a, to a new service, I place that credentials on my KeePass, uh, KeePass password manager. And of course, my KeePass password manager is backed up to several machines, several different machines. And other accounts that you have. And you, if you do this, if you sit down and then take an inventory of your accounts, you will realize that you have a lot of accounts that are unused and you, can, you might actually delete those, those accounts and then uh, so that they will not be a part of a data breach in the future. That's it for the inventory of online accounts. Okay, uh, the next one is malicious documents. So I think this will be somehow an, uh, a demonstration of the possibilities about uh, attacks or computer security. So actually more of a demonstration, but it will somehow give you an idea of the concept. So normally when we have documents, we trust them. Uh, let's say at the start of the semester, students would send me email asking me to sign this Word document. And uh, the college sec will be releasing some of their documents uh, online and posting them by uh, Facebook, for example. And uh, me, for example, as an attacker, I would, uh, my, my motivation is uh, to get hold of all the CAS student records. How I will do that as an attacker? So I will take advantage of the pandemic and the work from home setup, and I will start up with creating an email. So what I did for this demonstration is I went to the College Sec Facebook page, CAS uh, College Sec Facebook page, and I looked for some documents there that template documents that I can use. And I found something like uh, a document for a college clearance. So as an attacker, I can, let's say, craft a message, an email message, as discussed earlier, that looks something, something like this. So Catherine A. Uh, Santos, and then uh, it says, good day, sir, mom. I would like to request for a college clearance. Please find my request form here, okay? So let's say there is a staff from the CAS College Secretary who received this message okay, from a student. And of course, the staff did not check the email address hidden here, okay? So, so he, he or he or she assumed that this is a legit student because he indicate, she indicated uh, her course and her initials actually resemble CAS. Right? So this must be a CAS student. And then, although I, I mentioned a while ago that you should not click any links, but since the staff actually uh, realized, oh, this is a legit student, so he or she click this link, which contains the request form. And then this is what happens. So actually when, when the staff will click this, she will be redirected to a new window and then she will be asked to download this clearance.document. And this is a legit clearance form, which actually I downloaded from the CAS, uh, CAS uh, Facebook page. And then 
what is interesting so this will be op opened in the office uh word office 365 word document uh, word process word program and i crafted this document to contain malicious code okay and then when i enable uh editing what will happen is it will prompt again saying enable content but there is a message here please uh enable active content to be able to input data to the form fields so if the staff is not knowledgeable about these things he or she might click enable content and uh before that on the right uh, this is the document that was open right on the right this is the hacker this is the window of the hacker and it's actually listening for connections from this uh for the target to open this document so when the staff cs staff let's say click enable content what will happen is that on the attacker machine located somewhere this means that the attacker has already gained access to the machine when the staff opened this particular document. And at this point, the attacker now can send commands to the computer. For example, this command here allows the attacker to obtain the IP address of the machine where this uh, public IP address where this machine is located. As you can see here, it is from the UPLB network. Okay. For demonstration purposes, I will send this email to you later. Okay. This email so that you can try it on your, uh, on your own. But the point here is the attacker, by just enable, enabling those contents, can now take control of the victim's machine, in this case, the staff at the Khalid Sec office, and he can do anything. For example, uh, from, from the command and control server, I was able to launch a calculator process shown here. Okay. And uh, if you are me, for example, is an investigator, I can see that Winward X here is uh, the, the word process or the program running, and there is a particular program called one OneDrive host conf, conf .x here running, which is actually the malware that allows me to uh, control this machine. And uh, you can see here, this is the program, and it connects to my machine, my server which actually controls the, this command and control server and is connecting to this particular. This means that the machine, if the college secretary staff open this on her machine, I can now access uh, the computer that she's using and download the student's data to my machine. So this is one possibility of an attack, attack scenario. It's very important that we are uh, knowledgeable. And the key takeaway in this illustration, in this demonstration, is make sure that you don't have active contents in your document. You don't enable. Uh, when, when you receive emails like this, make sure you, you do, that you don't enable these contents, whatever happens, from students, from from other uh, from other uh, sources. Okay, so we move on to the next item, which is OAuth two. So OAuth two is a way to allow you to authorize certain resources and sometimes also used for authentication. For example, you can sign in uh, to a, a new service by just Signing in with, so you can say sign in with uh, Gmail, sign in with 
Facebook, so whatever identity uh, provider uh, that are available or that is supported by a particular platform. For example, in the, I have here a uh, Mi Band. So I use my Facebook uh, uh, account to sign sign in uh, uh, this Mi Band uh, form. So you should actually that means that Mi Band or the uh, yes the 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 company that uh, sells or that sells Mi Band can now access my data from Facebook. Anyway. So it's a form of authorization, and uh, this is how it's done. So let's say you are the <clears throat> say you are the owner, then you have a new app, right? So the new owner will access the app. Then uh, what will happen if you sign in with Facebook? This app will ask for a login page with the client ID if it's not already logged in so we have an authorization server then so if not logged in then the user will log in to the endpoint then uh, it will ask permissions right? and then uh, the rest are technical steps but essentially what will happen is the uh, the resource owner or the new user for this app will gain access to the uh, resources uh, post, uh, used by Facebook to get information. Like in some way, uh, the advantage of that is I don't have to create a new account because I can use uh, uh, the author authorization server to uh, ensure that ah, this is the me who is logging in. Okay. So the main problem with this, uh, especially nowadays when there are a lot of apps that are coming out that says uh, you can use your UP, uh, for example, of this will be the, the faculty regent uh, votation system where you can use the, uh, uh, your, G or your UP mail to vote. Okay. So this is how it's done. Okay. Now, a main issue with this is uh, there might, uh, I'm not saying that there are some implementation problems, but most common implementation, most common threats when it comes to things like this, your, your OAuth, is that some developers might uh, leak some information that can compromise the data. Okay? So that is something to watch out for also, especially apps that claims that you can use your UP mail account to connect to this server or to use this app. I for other topics, uh, connecting to public Wi-Fi. As much as possible, don't connect to public Wi-Fi or you connect, you can use a VPN right? so that the connection will be tunneled through the B VPN. Uh, next one is cloud security. Nowadays, Especially during the start of the semester, we usually share folders, okay? and uh, we have a very limited uh, access control mechanism when sharing Google uh, Google folders or Google data. So we have to be vigilant and careful whenever we send uh, links that points to uh, Google shares. Because we might actually leak some information to unintended recipients. Example: uh, There was a, a security incident wherein uh, the groups, uh, the groups, uh, we have Google groups, right? So uh, an ordinary user is able to see the uh, private groups because they belong to. Uh, UP uh, under the UP domain is a problem. So that particular incident was reported by a student from uh, UP Open University, and I validated his uh, uh, his uh, findings and reported that to the ITD. And as you can see right now, the groups is actually 
disabled uh, in the meantime. And also misconfigurations and poor access control. So uh, sometimes we have uh, shared storage Dropbox and other uh, uh, cloud storage systems, and sometimes we misconfigure them. And if you read the news about security breaches or data breaches, actually, you will see that a lot of uh, data leaked are coming from misconfigured uh, S3 buckets, which is storage system provided by Amazon. And some developer uh, did not properly secure this storage, uh, uh, storage cloud storage. So the data uh, was uh, leaked to the public and it's now uh, distributed, being distributed. Okay. So for reporting security incidents, we can look at, uh, we have the following, of course, we have the we can report our findings. The default actually is to report them to ITC at UPLB, but I don't know their policies in this work from home setup. If they are entertaining uh, incidents or if they are entertaining requests from a work from home setup, uh, ICT support at up.edu.ph. So there was a recent uh, email from ITDC that there is an ongoing uh, phishing attack for top UP ex executives and they use this email. If you want to know more information, then uh, you can do that. Or we can go directly to the uh, PNP, Anti-Cyber Crime Group. And uh, they have this Facebook page and there are a lot of contact information that you can use to uh, report any security incident. So uh, with that, I would like to end my webinar and I'd like to thank you all for listening and we are now ready for your question. Thank you.